Okay. My relationship with Southampton started in December 1980. I was born in Princess Anne Hospital and the city has been my home ever since. I went to school, college and university all in Southampton. My first job was at what was then known as Southampton Solent University and my current job is at the University of Southampton. When I was writing this, I realised just how boring I must sound, which is probably true, but it's also a testament to how proud I am of the city. It's where my wife and I are bringing up both of our daughters, both of whom were born at Princess Anne Hospital too. The caveat to all of this, I have to confess, is that my wife is from the West Midlands and at least once a week she will tell me that she wants to move back because it's so much better there. This is an ongoing point of contention in the Saran household, but I am standing strong, you'll be pleased to know. I've seen the city change, grow and modernise over the years. It doesn't take long to get to a beach or a place of green tranquility with a new forest. We have mosques, Hindu mandus, Sikh gurdwaras, churches and more. We have a rich history from the Bargate, which was fantastically lit up just prior to the bid submission, to being the home of Jane Austen and the place where the Spitfire was built. But there are always opportunities to be better and ways for us to get involved in making our city greater, leading to, we hope, gaining the city of uh, culture status in 2025. And that's what tonight's event is all about, showcasing our awesome city and all of the walks of life that live here and exploring the possibilities and the opportunities the city of culture status will present us. Tonight, we'll be joined by a panel of guests who will tell us about the bid journey so far as a city, as a university and as a community. We'll then move to a Q&A where at home you'll have an opportunity to put your questions to our panel. You'll find a Q&A box on your screen, so please do add your questions throughout and make sure you vote for your favourite questions too. It's my absolute pleasure to introduce tonight's first guest, Shalina Permalu. You'll no doubt recognise Shalina from BBC MasterChef. She is a, a regular on our TVs and radio and since 2016 has successfully run Southampton's number one street food restaurant, the Kazmaman Mauritian Street Kitchen. Shalina is the chair of the Southampton 2025 Trust and tonight we welcome her here to tell us about her personal stories, her passion and pride for the city. Welcome Shalina. Thank you very much Boo, lovely to be here. Um, so for those of you who don't know, I'm a proud Setonian at heart with Mauritian heritage and spent my first half of my career working in the field of equality and diversity across London and the South East. However, after 10 years in the industry, I was having what I'd like to call a quarter life crisis and needed a change. I was always the cook amongst my friends um, and I was always the woman who was infamous for feeding the masses at university parties. So back in 2012, fueled by the passionate friends that I have and um, steering into the direction of going into food, I entered MasterChef. I ended up winning the amateur series of BBC's MasterChef with my tropical Mauritian menu. And I was the first woman of colour to win any cooking show back then, which led me to some really interesting media work. This morning, Sunday brunch, a lot of work in radio and press. It was an incredible time, but I was certainly a rabbit in headlights, having never worked in media before. However, even though I enjoyed my fame in media, I had this looming guilt, which was I hadn't quite pursued the ultimate dream, which was to open my own restaurant and feed the masses with my beautiful African Mauritian food. After being pursued by many investors and venture capitalist companies to open a large restaurant in London, I decided to take whatever savings I had left and returned to Southampton the city I was born in and the city that made me. All the nostalgia returned to me and I realised how proud I was to be making my mark back in the city that allowed me to dream big as a teenager and the city that embraced and proudly celebrated my return. I didn't think it was fair that London was always the main place that new food trends start. So bringing the first ever Mauritian street food concept to Southampton was both daunting and exciting as an entrepreneur. I often questioned whether Southampton was ready for my spices, the tropical flavours, the mangoes and coconuts. So when I first opened the restaurant back in 2016, I actually tempered down the flavours. I sort of watered them down, thinking that the city wasn't quite ready. Um, within a few months, I got some feedback from customers and they said, you know what? We were expecting more chilli, more fire, more heat. And so I gave it to them. I changed all the recipes and made myself the most authentic version of a chef as I could be. Um, and that was really based on feedback from my, my local customers from Southampton. When I think of Southampton's rich cultural diversity, we only need to think of the food and restaurants that, we, that exist in our community. And we can be transported to so many different places from Korea, Mauritius, Brazil, Iran, Turkey, West Indies, Nigeria, Afghanistan. 
That's just naming a few. We are a city who is proud of its settled communities and new emerging communities, each one of these further enriching the soil we stand on. We as a people of Southampton are diverse in thought, artistic, creative, and so to be proud of Southampton means to be proud of who we are. The next step we all need to take is collective and we collectively need to stand up together and say we will make some bold moves. We can make this city something we can all be proud of not just in the makeup of his restaurants, but in the makeup of its governance and the organisations that we're all part of. Ultimately, if we all embrace diversity within our businesses, we can then unlock the true potential of our city. So what is Southampton City of Culture? What can it mean for our city? Um, so as the new chair of Southampton 2025 City of Culture Trust, I'm going to give you a quick overview of what this is and what it can actually mean for our city. UK City of Culture is a title given to a city for a period of one year. The competition is administered by DCMS and has a panel of independent judges. The title of UK City of Culture brings real economic, cultural and social benefits leading up to, during and beyond the year that the city will hold that status. So let's look at someone that has won. So let's have a look at Hull, UK City of Culture. What did it mean for them? Well, it meant that they uh, the, there was an increase in value of tourism up to £300 million in 2017. Uh, they increased tourist visits by £6 million. More than nine in ten residents were engaged with at least one cultural activity and nearly 800 new jobs were created. One in four new businesses in, were in, uh, employed new staff and also 56,000 young people took part with 34% reporting improvements in their own self-esteem. In terms of Southampton and our timelines, where are we with the bid? Well, the bid was submitted on the 2nd of February and there's a massive sigh of relief amongst the bid team and it was excellent. The decision from DCMS and the expert panel for the shortlist will happen around the 21st of March. The shortlist will be for four locations and we'll have to do a presentation to the expert panel in mid-May. And I say we will, because I think we will. <laughs> the announcement of the winning city will be the end of May. So how can you help? Follow our social media, everyone. Go on now, onto your Twitter, onto your Instagram, follow at Southampton 2025. Please make that step. We want as many people following our journey as much as possible. And I want to finish by showing you some of our inclusion pledges our partners have committed to as part of our collective City of Culture journey. Whatever happens, change is coming. And I hope you are all part of this exciting journey for us as a city. Thank you so much for your time. Hi there, my name's Laura Reed, and I'm the General Manager of West Quay in Southampton. And I'm here today to talk about our inclusion pledge. So the first one of our short term goals for making West Quay a fully inclusive destination was to undertake an accessibility audit of the centre to make sure that everyone of all abilities could access our facilities. The second one of our short term goals was to make sure that within the centre we celebrated or recognised LGBTQ plus history month in February. Thirdly, we want to look at our event strategy for 2022 and beyond to make sure that our event strategy is truly inclusive and that we are putting on a range of events that appeal to a broad range of people from the Southampton community. Hello, my name is Kwame from African Activities. This our pledge is very important to us. It's something we are doing already to make sure everyone is free because we have to stick to what we say. If you plant a tree, you need to water the tree to grow. So if we pledge to do something, we have to focus on it and make sure it's done. And that's why pledging is very important for Southampton. My name is Marky e. Smith and I'm the President and Vice-Chancellor of the University of Southampton. The University is so proud to be a city partner in Southampton's bid for UK City of Culture 2025. We can only truly achieve our aspirations if our community reflects the diverse society around us. So this is our pledge. Our mission is to create an inclusive university community. Equality, Diversity and Inclusion, EDI, is a core strategic focus for the university. We can harness our collective strengths and the lived experiences of our people to make a difference. And this is our chance to come together as a community and ensure we are doing all we can to achieve equality.
That was really insightful. Thank you, Shalina. And it's been great to hear from you. And it was lovely to see the commitment shared by key figures from across the city. Next up, we're going to hear from Professor Fraser Sturt, who is an alumnus and a professor at the university, who has been leading the research and evaluation for the bid. Fraser will be take, talking to us about how the university has played such a crucial role in the bid so far. Fraser, over to you. Thanks, Pete. Yeah, it has been genuinely <clears throat> an amazing thing to do in terms of engaging with City of Culture because the university, in fact, the universities have been really critical to both gathering our improving our understanding of, of the need within the city and the opportunity, but also unpicking the phenomenal research that occurs in the institutions and the contribution it could make to the city as well. So. I think for many of us, it's been about connecting within and seeing what we all do, because often our focus is outward and international, but to look within and see what can we do within the place that we occupy. And then it's also been really affirming and we've learned a lot from engaging with our partners within the city as well, seeing the strengths that are there and just the opportunities that have emerged from people who have been thinking about things that we have, but from completely different angles. So. It's been a challenge, but it's been one that's been really positive to engage with. It's been one of the few occasions where I've sat in rooms with people from Solent University, with sort of major charity groups, but also just interested people within the city who want a point to make and want their voice to be heard. And personally, living in the city for, for 17 years now, I've written down 15 in my notes, but I realise that's wrong. It's also been really eye opening in terms of what our city is and its variability, its strengths, but also its really profound needs at times. And the opportunity we have as a community, as a university to, to contribute in addressing those things. And this is where it's really tied into the emergent uh, civic agenda within the university is, is what is the place of a university within a city? What are our roles and responsibilities? Many of us live here, we are people of the city, but we also have expertise that we can share and bring to bear. So that's been really, inspiring and sort of empowering in that sense. But I suppose one of the the other elements that's really come to the fore over the particularly the last few months is just the sheer appetite of people wanting to engage with it. So within the university, this is a, a force to be able to bring different parts of the community together and to think about how they might be engaged in a civic project like this has been transport um, transformative. And in some ways, that's been one of the most exciting things, because although the bid has been submitted, that is a statement of our intentions. It's the framework and it's the plan of what we want to do when we win. As Shalina was saying, this is the opportunity to put these things into action and to plan and to expand that. And we know that there is far more that we can do and we can leverage from these communities as well. So as a university, this is really tied into what we're trying to achieve and what we're trying to in, put into words in terms of our civic agenda at the moment. But it's also about allowing many of us who work within and live within the city to think about how we can apply this in a different way. And from a personal perspective, it's been a really good chance to, to meet those uh, different researchers from across the university who've already been doing these things and to shine a spotlight on these different areas of research. And I think I'll, I'll sort of tie this up by saying that we know that there is more to be had uh, and there's more engagement that we can we can bring together through um, the role of uh, City of Culture as a sort of a, an action in that way. And, and that's what we really want to focus on on this period. So it was a celebration to get it in, but it was also a real motivation to go. We can do more with this and there's a real chance here to, to transform the city that we live in. I feel I should talk more, but there you go. <laughs> That's right. Thanks, Fraser. That's incredible how much thought and effort has gone into the work that you and colleagues have been doing. So thank you very much for sharing that uh, with us. Uh, I'm now pleased to uh, introduce Rob Kern. Like myself, Rob is Southampton born and bred. Rob's undertaken a variety of roles in the voluntary, community and social enterprise sector since the late 1990s and is currently the CEO of the Southampton Voluntary Services. Um, and the Voluntary Services has played a leading role in supporting the City of Culture bid from early conversations to, to through to the consultation. So I'm very pleased to welcome Rob to tell us more about the importance of community involvement. Excellent. Thank you for that very generous introduction, um, Boo. And uh, as Boo's alluded to, yes, I am Southampton uh, born and bred. Been here since uh, 1972. Um, which makes me 50 just the other week, actually. But uh, 
CEO of SBS, incredibly proud that we've been involved in um, in the in the City of Culture bid. Uh, it's something that's very close to our hearts as an organisation. And I think the thing that I'm that you know I've been really feeling for the last ten years is that Southampton is a is a rising star. Um, things are really changing in this city for the for the better. And some of that I want to talk about um, a little bit. But but also we are a city with with divisions in terms of inequalities as well. And there's a great hope amongst many of us that this opportunity can go some way towards tackling um, some of that in the city. So a little bit of context. Um, I think we've got a real opportunity here to put Southampton back on the map. Um, when I think back to the early 90s, when the city had been through a period of, it entered this post-industrial kind of period, and we'd lost a lot of our local assets in terms of um, employment, like sh like shipbuilding, like ancillary light industry that surrounded the docks, um, cable laying, lots of these things kind of went, as in many other cities around the, around the, uh, around the UK. And I think actually that ripped part of our, part of our identity as a city away and I think our top confidence as a city took a downward turn at that point in time. Now I think when we fast forward to the noughties actually things started to change and we started to get a grasp again on on who we were as a city and as we went through the noughties I think that really started to gather momentum. I'd say there was a really big feeling amongst our communities at that time that, you know, Southampton was a wonderful place. Look at our heritage. You know, it goes back thousands of years. Look at, you know, look at all the kinds of things that are going on in the city, our homegrown talent, our wonderful art galleries, um, the diversity in foods and things that have been spoken about already. But actually, were we singing about those things? Were we, you know, were we really saying, look at Southampton, this is a marvellous place? And I'm sorry to say, I don't think we were at that point in time. But I think that has really changed. And I think us going for City of Culture, I think for us having that opportunity to develop the wonderful cultural quarter has actually started to get our civic pride kind of back on track to where it should be. Now, within all of this, there has been a myriad of opportunities for our incredibly diverse communities to be involved um, in the bid and to have really strong voices about what Southampton, what our heritage, what our culture means to them. And it's so many different perspectives. There are so many different perspectives on Southampton from its residents, from its different, different communities. And I think that process in itself has been something that is absolutely fascinating to see what the city means to people. There have been lots of opportunities for people to get involved in the bid through through consultations, through engagement um, exercises, through all of our wonderful City of Culture ambassadors that are rooted within our communities. And not least through organisations like SBS playing a part in, in the development of, you know, volunteering strategy for City of Culture. All things which aim to include um, our residents and our communities more in, in what this bid is all about. I do recognise that the hard work that's been undertaken by the City of Culture team, you know, it's been challenging, particularly over the last couple of years, whilst we've been going through, um, you know, the pandemic, it's not been easy. And also it's not been easy because actually, you know, this bid is kind of top secret, we're in competition. So there haven't been the opportunities necessarily to sing back to our residents what what the communities have been telling the City of Culture. But I'm hoping that now, now that the bid has been signed, sealed, delivered, if you like, that we're going to have that opportunity to once again really get people massively on board about what this means for Southampton and what they have told us and kind of reflect back what their vision of the city is. Um, I, think, I think we've got some really marvellous opportunities within all of this. I think not only in terms of, you know, celebrating our unique identity as a port town, as a as a place of arrivals that is an incredibly, you know, tolerant place where so many different cultures rub up against each other so, so well. But I think also we've got an opportunity through this, as I as I alluded to earlier, to to really try to tackle some of those deep rooted inequalities within the city and really boost the level of city confidence in all of the areas of the city. Um, I'll just finish on the one thought that uh, I personally believe 
that by our anchor organisations across sectors coming together with civil society, working hand in hand with our communities, we can achieve sometimes what things that, that may seem impossible. And I think this has been demonstrated so strongly over the pandemic um, over the last couple of years when we've seen people coming forward from communities and working so closely with our NHS and, and local government and the like. Um, but I think if we can harness that energy, and I feel, feel that we have done within our within our bid, then, uh, you know, we are we are heading towards success. So City of Culture 25, bring bring it on. Bring it on, I say, because I think together we can definitely make it so. Right. Thank you very much. That's brilliant. Thank you, Rob. And also a genuine thank you to everyone who supports the work of Southampton Voluntary Service for all of the important work that you do with the community and charities. Um, I'd like to welcome back onto the screen Chilina, Fraser and Rob for the next 10 or so minutes so that we can share some questions from the audience with you. We'll start with a number of questions submitted in advance that we've grouped into themes and then we can move on to um, live questions. So um, the first question is around the theme of the benefits um, of the bid to both the city and community. Thea Karaki, a member of uh, staff from the University of Southampton has asked, what are the benefits of Southampton becoming a city of culture in the short and long term, respectively, and how will that ref um, affect local people's lives? Go for it, Rob. Yeah, thanks. I'll um, I'll come back in just on the just uh, just around communities, really, which obviously I've just been speaking about. But um, I think there's something really, really important. If we uh, there's something really, really important here about raising. Um, raising the confidence and the aspiration of Southampton. Now, I think we've been heading in the right direction on this one, but I think with City of Culture, actually what we can do is we can gift everyone in the city. But I think for me, particularly our young people, to have opportunities to get involved with things that are so exciting and celebratory about the place that they are from. And I think that is so important in, in developing a sense of, civic pride but also in strengthening our civil society uh within within the city i remember as a child we used to have something called southampton show i was in the scouting movement and i remember camping at southampton show which happened over four days i believe and we you know showcased our knot tying and abseiling and you know camp craft to the public and i was so proud to be part of that and to think that we can develop opportunities like this for our children and young people and all of our diverse communities. I just think that's absolutely wonderful. So that's that's what I've got to say about it. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Go on, Fraser. Yeah. <laughs> well, I was just going to sort of say about, um, yeah, absolutely, Rob. I echo everything that you're saying. I think often enough when we think of culture and we think of the arts, it's sometimes quite inaccessible to a large cohort of our communities. And bringing City of Culture and having that title raises aspirations, it raises our self-confidence, and it can bring culture into those communities. And I think the whole point is here, we're trying to harness everyone in this movement. So if we know that those communities are invested and are involved in that discussion around City of Culture, it means it's going to impact them and their generation. City of Culture is all about legacy. It's not just about one year and 365 days of events. It's what will happen to Southampton after City of Culture. And that's what we all need to work together in this infrastructure um, of third sector, private companies, getting everyone together on a, a, on a multi-agency approach. And I think that is what's so exciting. Yeah, and just to follow up, it's been... The entire bid, as, as Shalina said in her talk, is, is really about addressing those needs and opportunities through culture. So this is what the bid is about. It's about planning about short term to mid and long term benefits. So how can what Rob and Shalina was talking about there in terms of confidence and pride be mobilised to address some of the need within the city? And that's what Claire has really worked on with the programming team to devise a structure that I think will surprise people in terms of it is, as Shalini said, it's culture is a broader thing than might be first imagined, getting people to engage, but also looking at some of those things which we know are, are, are critical problems in the city as well, to do with health and inequality. So this is a programme which is, 
is a celebration. It's got to be, you know, this is part of what we're doing, but it's also about delivering on things which people in the city need and making that sustainable into the future. And I know it's really easy for me to say this, but genuinely through working with colleagues in the university, the city council and so on, this is what we've been spending a lot of time doing going, okay, so how do we know what the need is and where it is? And how can we deliver this as a community uh, and support it? And, and I think that's what's, what's really transformative about City of Culture is it's hard to see other vehicles which can deliver change in the way it can. And that's not just said because I'm being involved in the bid, but you can see, as, as Rob was saying, what's, what happens in the, in, this, in the city and its history. There's loads to be proud of, but there's also a way in which we, we tell that story and also how it's played out in, in choices we may have made and, and, and how we've engaged different or, or left different communities behind at times. And this is about how we collectively redress some of that and, and look more positively to the future. And that's why it has been so, so exciting because it's not just warm words about cultural events. This is a plan for the city uh, and its communities to, to do more. Brilliant, thank you very much. Um, and it's, uh, the next couple of questions are actually about campaign legacy. So just going back to your point, Shalina. So David Wright, a University of Southampton member of staff asks, uh, or says, I very much hope that Southampton wins the City of Culture bid and wish you the best of luck. If we were not selected, however, how can we maintain the energy and the interest the process has generated over the past couple of years to ensure a rich cultural life for the city post pandemic? Go on, Fraser, uh, you want to say you, something? Fraser, are you ready for this one? Yeah, I can, um, and, but feel free to, um, to cut across me. Uh, in the, yeah, as you might expect, there's a lot of time and effort that's been invested in this and actually central to, to writing the bid, we have to write a plan B as well. And it's one of the interesting lessons from City of Culture. We're going to win. We obviously, you know, this is why we enter things. It's like writing a grant application. You, you don't write it not to get it. You write it uh, to win. But cities who haven't won have done really well. And I um, and as a team, we talked to many of those cities about how those that felt they'd achieved a lot from the bidding process, even though they didn't win, how they achieved it. And as uh, as the question indicates, it's about the people and the relationships, really. So once that shared desire has been identified and the opportunity becomes clear, it's in some ways it, it's quite hard not to follow through. And, and we've created really, really clear pathways for that to happen. So there are some things which we've had to commit to in terms of structures and, and support mechanisms to within the bid to ensure that there is an outcome whether we get city of culture or not now obviously it's on a slightly different trajectory because that's the idea of winning is it, it increases the rate and pace of change but everyone who's involved in this is incredibly committed to acting on this it's it's very hard not to read some of the feedback from the consultation or see some of the data about the city and and not think how can we not do something about this? Because there is acute need in some areas and also an amazing opportunity. So it's both of those things. I was just gonna say as well, um, in terms of the actual initial consultations, it's been one of the most um, successful citywide consultations with the most, uh, with some of the highest levels of engagement from across sector. So from some of our most traditionally underrepresented groups far and wide. So I think that alone will show that we've already created a vehicle for change, which is sustainable. Um, and as Fraser has mentioned, there is plan B. Obviously, the details of the bid we can't yet talk about because it's still incredibly competitive. Um, but we're all working hard to make sure that those um, th those key connections will remain as part of our legacy, irrespective of whether we win or not. Brilliant. And uh, I'd, I mean, I'd, I'd also add, I think the process, the process of that collaboration between the, the different sectors that have been involved with this is one of the things that's one of the big takeaways for it, as is that engagement with the public telling us and make, making being really vocal about what they kind of think about about the city and about culture in the city. And I think the thing is, is through all of this, what we're, what we're showing is that there is a will there is a will in Southampton that is collective about making a real difference to the city. And, you know, as I alluded to earlier when I spoke, I don't think that's always been the case. I think we're in a really powerful position as a city where we're very much aligned across different organisations 
and with our communities to really make something happen. Brilliant, thank you. So within the same theme of legacy, uh, Ash Hunt, a SUSU employee and someone who I've actually had the pleasure of working with in the past, um, says the City of Culture 2017 in Hull emphasised the importance of legacy throughout the year and has since seen a number of projects continue since then under the banner of City of Culture. So what plan does Southampton's project team have to ensure that this will be the case if the bid is successful for us? <laughs> this is, this is, this should, we should have been able to pass this one over to Claire. But... I'm looking at Fraser, but yeah, Claire, for sure. It would be great to have Claire. <laughs> So I'm I'm here and I I can come in if that's uh, appropriate. I mean, um, we do want to make sure that the um, all the work that's put in comes to fruition. Um, I mean, I think that uh, there is no doubt that we have had a, a you know a really strong breadth of support and there's such a lot to build on. Um, we are form we formulated our plan B to some extent in the bid, um, but obviously that's not where we're focusing our efforts at the moment because we've said we'll have a plan B. We said we'll want to um, mobilise the support that we've garnered. We've said that we want to benefit from the process no matter what happens. But right now we want to focus on the on winning and all the things that we have to do to try and make sure that our chances are absolutely tip top between now and the end of May. And so one of the things that we're doing at the moment is we are planning as though we're going to be shortlisted because that's the only thing that we can really do to make sure that we can work within the timescales and be at our very best. So I'm sure that's probably not the detail of what will happen if we don't win. But the thinking is there. The planning has started. But our focus right now is, is on winning and putting our absolute best foot forward. Brilliant. Thank you, Claire. And, and while you're there, I'll, I'll, I'll introduce you. And if you're most welcome to stay with us on, on, on this Q&A panel. Um, so this is Claire Whitaker. Bid director um, who's been, sorry, a director of the International Live Music and Cultural Events Organization has been appointed to take forward the bids out, um, the Southampton's bid to become the UK City of Culture in 2025. I'm sorry, my words got mixed up there in, in, uh, in my script. Uh, it is a very big pleasure to have you with us. Um, so going back to the pre-submitted questions, uh, the next set of questions are looking to explore the views on what the bid means for the wider region and, and businesses. So Ralph White, a member of local community, asks, how will further flung neighbourhood areas and outskirts become involved? Sh shall I shall I come forward on that? Because I've I've been working with my colleague Gemma on um, on some of the relationships uh, beyond our city walls. And um, we've, we're really, really pleased because um, the, they changed the rules on City of Culture back in June so that you could actually apply uh, as a group of uh, places or even in Cornwall's case as a whole county. We knew that our need was best articulated through Southampton because of all the research that Fraser and his team have done so brilliantly shows that. But we did want to respond to this new context. So we have done partnerships with our 10 uh, neighbouring councils. So that's the whole of the Solent region, including the Isle of Wight, and also, uh, and as far up as Test Valley, so the whole the whole Solent region, and also um, Bournemouth, Christchurch and Poole, um, who are very, very interested in um, working with us. And actually, from a point of view of the programme, there's lots that they've brought uh, in terms of co-commissioning, because they've got obviously Poole Lighthouse there, which is a very big player in the region. Um, so the idea is, is that each of those councils are able to showcase one or two things that resonate with our themes as part of our programme and that we will develop a regional tourism offer together. But I actually think if we win, we will be doing a lot more because the, the partnerships that we've got are um, both um, top down and bottom up in that we've got huge enthusiasm from the organisations on the ground, a bit like we have in Southampton. We've got it at both, at both levels. Um, so we've also got real support from the uh, leaders and chief executives of our neighbours. And so there's so much to build on there. I think we've done really, really well to build such a strong constituency. And that's also changed our relationship with people like the LEP, 
because suddenly, you know, a large number of their board members are now actively involved in the bid, whereas when we started, it was only Southampton. So, um, yeah, we're really, really pleased with the regional and beyond, actually, support that we've that we've got. Yeah, and just to, to add to what Claire's saying there, um, and it sort of relates to the previous question as well, is that there's the central core of the bid, but what we've seen in Coventry and in Hull, things bubble up alongside it, which you, we definitely encourage. And that's what's really exciting at the moment. As you can see that there is there's so much more that can and will happen. And in terms of the wider regional impact, we know from sort of the economic analysis that's been done within the universities and by the city council, it's it's a really connected region. So, so what happens in Southampton will have impacts that spread beyond it in terms of connections across industry, supply chains and communities. So again, it's a, it's a really real and incredible impact that you can trace through what's um, projected. And then we know that there's also gonna be lots of things which are gonna emerge as we develop when we're successful and um, the program in terms of unintended consequences and people seizing on this opportunity. And so it is that sense of just a, an expanding bubble that really we're, we're, we're thinking about here. Brilliant. Thank I, you. Uh, I come in quickly on that one as well. Yeah, it does also relate to the previous question about legacy, but I think there's something here about the about the city of culture opportunity acting as a catalyst for community action so really getting local people to be inspired to contribute in some way to their to their communities whether that's through you know involvement in, in events or through volunteering and i would really personally really like to see you know a legacy that kind of comes out of that of increasing community activity within the city and actually, Rob, if I can come in on that, one of the things that's already happened on the legacy front is that we've been invited, along with all the bidding cities, even if they didn't get long listed, to go for the spirit of 2012 uh, grant, which actually is to promote volunteering, which we're in the process of, um, of, of going for an EOI. Um, at the moment, which has to be in in the middle of March. So um, and the things that we we've, we've already done, like the inclusion work, uh, the Inspire series that we've done for cultural and community leaders about building capacity. We, yeah. Whenever we've spent money on anything, we've tried to make sure that it would benefit the city, whether we win or not. Um, uh, and uh, even our branding that we did for City of Culture, we, we actually briefed the designers to actually create something that could have a life even if we didn't win because so much consultation had gone into that branding. So we've really been trying to think about, I suppose, value for the city and what we can leave behind even if we're not successful. Um, and as I say, you know, I, I've, I find it hard to talk about not being successful, but I do think about it. I just don't like saying it because I, I, I'm a great person, that believer in that you visualise what you want. But uh, believe you me, we have really thought about it. And um, we know that uh, whatever happens, I mean, even things like the Pulse Group that's cre been created for some of the cultural leaders in the city to swap information, which started as a COVID response and actually has stayed as a way of really sharing what we're doing more. The working groups where people have really enjoyed coming together, we think that there is a life in those things beyond the City of Culture bid or when we win um, as part of making sure that this, this city-wide, this regional-wide consultation and impact continues. It's so it's so nice to hear everybody really vying to get their answers in here because it just <laughs> shows the passion that everyone's got for this. It's, it's really lovely to hear it. Uh, so we'll move on to some live questions. So everyone at home, please do continue to get your questions in for the panel. Um, I'm going to start with a question. Um, how will being a city of culture benefit young people in education? Will there be opportunities for schools to contribute to these exciting plans? <laughs> now, now, now we're all waiting for each other, but uh, absolutely. So we've been working very closely um, with schools in the city and they've been an amazing uh, respondent in terms of to, to themes and ideas in the programme. But obviously as a key constituent group within the city, um, uh, young people in school and also students drive a, a big part of the demographic uh, and also they are they, they, they have a, an opportunity to be engaged in this way. So absolutely from the from the curriculum based things to the things they'll be able to enjoy and engage with outside of the school day as well. So 
how am I supposed to say, it is a key thing within the criteria within the bid as well. So as you'd imagine, and given the role of educational institutions in it as well, it's something that we pay very close attention to. But I really cannot speak highly enough of the engagement by heads teachers and the thought that has gone into how they can be engaged and what enrichment this might bring to, to children in school. And um, yeah, it's been one of the the sort of the really rewarding parts of this process is getting that feedback and people saying we could do this and we can do so much and there's also we really want to do this because we don't have this opportunity at the moment and for them to be able to see this will be transformative uh, and, and I think that's um, where we've got so I think I've sort of forgot the question halfway through but I think I was on the right lines there. That's brilliant thank you so much. Um, we have another question from Ralph White. Um, are there any plans to involve the older population? Their first hand accounts of life over many years is a valuable asset to our local community culture. Shall I, shall I come in there, uh, Boo? Uh, I mean, um, so one of the things about um, having to do all this consultation uh, um, in COVID was that we were very, very aware that some of our young people weren't um, uh, weren't operating as normal and where, where they normally were, either at schools or at community groups or young people's um, uh, uh, groups. Um, but the same was also um, true in terms of access to older people. Um, but we have done all that we can to try and make sure that their voice is a part of the bid. So we've worked very closely um, with uh, the adult services um, lead uh, guy in the cat in Southampton City Council. We've also consulted with um, Age UK and because of our work on the working groups, we've also had people on those groups that are working very closely with older people. So um, some of the other bids like, you know, Bradford is the youngest city in Europe and they have constantly um, talked about their young people and the opportunities the bid will have for young people and that's absolutely true and we want to have opportunities for our young people too it's very important they've had a very tough time in covid but our bid is about the whole city and that means that our um, older population also needs to be recognized and that they need to feel involved so we have taken that into account in our program we've taken that into account in our thinking um, and it certainly will be um, for our there's lots of intergenerational viewpoints in our program um, and there's also things that are specifically for our our older residents so I just want to reassure people that even though it's been difficult we have made sure that older people are thought about and represented and involved in the bid. Absolutely and I just want to add that actually a lot of consideration has gone into the actual programming so throughout those 365 days of events that we're planning um, regarding accessibility we've worked with a number of partners to identify that those projects and those cultural activities will also be accessible to a larger ageing community as well. Brilliant, thank you. Um, will winning, Lee Hula asks, will winning help areas outside of the city centre, places with big potential such as Western Shore? Yes, I think we're all so we're all going to vie to answer this. This is, as Claire said, this is about the whole city and a lot of our time and attention has been focused on I think it's reasonable to say that different parts of the city afford very different experiences and that's one of the things that the bid has to address is, is opening that up and making sure that that it has a reach that goes across the city to everyone in the city. This really is for everyone and that's why the consultation was so wide ranging and why it's still being pushed. So the city doesn't stop at the limits of the city centre and the shops and the civic centre it's most of our population lies beyond that and it's it's bringing that out so there's some really exciting things which um, are deliberately built in to enable that so again this isn't um, a warm words but there's a very clear plan about how to achieve that uh, not only uh, how to speak about it as a nice idea fun fact i was actually born and bred in Sholing, guys <laughs> <laughs> And I feel a bit mean, so not saying the specifics, but we are in that strange position where we're still waiting to be, uh, we're, we're waiting to hear about us being shortlisted. But um, yeah, we really know we did a quite a lot of work 
in the university about quantifying what it means to be in different parts of the city in terms of uh, opportunities, issues to do with health and sound, but things like travel time as well. It, it is a curious place that we all live. And I know that many of us love it very dearly, but it has its own quirks. And some of those create challenges that we, we want to overcome through this programme. Claire, I wonder if you'd be able to just say briefly a bit about the opening ceremony over the bank holiday, because that's in Western Shores. Yes, that's the, that's the one bit that we've actually released uh, as part of our plans. So our, we're going to start our City of Culture on in May 2020, uh, 2025 and go through to May 2026. And the opening, so the opening event is going to be uh, a huge um, extravaganza on the water over three days over that bank holiday, including a day working with the International Boat Show regarding access to the water. So you'll be able to try all sorts of things. But we're going to have flotillas of ships. We're going to have a floating stage and we're going to have um, an aerial display at Western Shore uh, itself, which will be some of the best um, aerialists in the world coming to Western Shore. They were involved in the Olympics. Um, and also um, some aerialists from all over the UK, because one of the things that you have to show is that you've, you're not only working with local artists and providers, but you're actually also um, uh, reaching out internationally and nationally. So that's our, our, our day when we're going to say Southampton is open to the world. Come and see us. Um, and um, absolutely, if you're on Western, um, you will have a, an absolutely fantastic experience and it will be free. Brilliant. Um, so Salish Palmer asks, apart from the social media following, what else can the residents of Southampton do to um, stand the best chance of winning? Well, I think at the moment it is probably the social media following because the judges are looking at our every move. So, but it's not just following, but it's also sharing our content content, saying how much you're looking forward to it, how excited you are, how involved the city's been in the consultation. Don't forget that this has been a virtual process. The judges haven't been here to the city, even incognito. We know that they've done that before in the past. None of that's been possible. So all they can see from our bid is what they see on socials. So please um, actively, it's not just a question of following, but it is about telling the world and telling the judges um, what, how excited you are about City of Culture, how much you're looking forward to it, how much you're backing it, and getting every single one of your friends, your family, your colleagues to do the same. And, and, I, and I'll just add one thing is, is also feel free to tell us things. It is being, the, the consultation, when that stopped in its first phase was not the end of this. It, it really is critical and it's a sort of a key part of what we're doing. It's, it, it's, it's not listening, it's, it's actually taking in and acting on what people say. And, and the more that people engage, the stronger the outcomes will be from City of Culture. So we're really keen that we have that, that, that dialogue is maintained. It's not seen to be something that, that happened and then is closed off, but actually this is about an ongoing conversation because this is, you know, this is about our city and, and things will change through time. So we need to keep that conversation going. Thank you. Um, another question, if there was one single selling point of Southampton, what would it be? Oh, oh it's an e well, that's hard, isn't it? <laughs> that's a difficult one, isn't it? I, I don't think it is a difficult one. No. Um, I'm going to be rude then and answer it because I'm talking too much, but it really is the people. <laughs> I know every single city is going to say this, but it is the the people that make the city. I mean, we have our built infrastructure, we've got our tangible heritage and all these things, but as Shalina said, it is remarkable that the, the communities we have here, the richness of it and how engaged they are. And it's that that will drive a city of culture. A city of culture is not a bar gate and, and some city walls and things like that. It is all about those communities and what they can achieve and the, the unique things. So it's it's everything from the, the science and the technology done in the universities to people performing music and cooking. That is what makes it. So it is definitely the people, their energy, their drive and their history. Absolutely. I'm an archaeologist. So, you know, history is important within this. But that is our strength and and that's what we should be really proud of in this in this um, competition. Absolutely and leading back to the social media angle in terms of following us on um, on socials it's telling us those stories 
you know, what are you all seeing in Southampton? What are you experiencing? How does it feel to you? And we want to keep that dialogue with all of our communities. We have had, we have had some feedback Boo, from the judges that they can tell that we're a city that's come together beyond the cultural sector. Um, that was our feedback from the, the expression of interest stage. And I think that, that we've been managing to show that even more because we've got lots of new partnerships um, confirmed. So um, that's what we're trying to reinforce. So uh, the more we can do that together, the better. Brilliant. Um, we have a question for Claire. Who is the best person to contact if we want to volunteer for 20, uh, SO25? Uh, that's a very good question. I think that if you want to volunteer, why don't you email uh, me directly? Um, uh, we haven't quite got that set up yet because obviously we're not in delivery mode. But if you email me, uh, then or the city or actually the city of culture um, address, which is on our website, then we will make sure that we um, keep your details. But also um, Rob and SVS and also Artworks are going to be very involved in the volunteering strategy and have been to date actually um, been fantastically supportive. So, um, you know, any of those routes, but probably me or the um, 2025 website is the best uh, starting point. Hopefully after tonight, you're going to be bombarded by messages. So uh, he's hoping. Um, can and you also, can I, can I, sorry, can I just add that, um, yeah, you can visit the Southampton Voluntary Services website and there should be information there about um, call outs for volunteers for existing cultural organisations. Um, maybe not, not associated with 2025 yet, but certainly if you wanted to get involved with those um, organisations. Thanks, Rob. Thank you. Um, can you talk a bit about the process of identifying Southampton's unique selling points? How did you uh, distill what makes our city distinctive? So that's a really good question. Claire, we're all right. Claire, do you want to answer or do you want to like? OK, so there is, there's always a variety of ways of doing this. There's sort of a top down and a bottom up route. And, and really, we, we drew heavily um, on the bottom up. It's talking to people in the city about what did they see as the strengths? And also alongside that, what changes do would people like to see happening? Because that was what was really telling and, and, and revealed what different communities saw as, as key strengths and selling points. So the consultation, again, it sounds like we're drawing on it really heavily and it's an easy thing to say, but it was really important for that because it stopped it being overly driven by, you know, um, a single line. So those of us sort of have an interest in narrative and, and maybe history realise how s easy it is for a single story to dominate and actually a, a need for allow space for other narratives to come to the fore. And that's one of the things that we've really worked on here. So there are you could almost be as as, as blase and saying there are as many strengths as there are sort of communities that want to recognize them but there are areas you know where we have real contributions in 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 terms of some of the sciences and technologies and um, and some of our offer in terms of attraction and so on so we can do it by a list and using metrics if we want to but it was sort of more interesting to see how those were reflected by what people said and it was also really validating when unprompted, when you sort of went through the consultation, certain things began to bubble up to the surface. So our, our green spaces, our waterfronts, our, our strong history of sort of, of research and actually in community engagement was also there as well. So it does, it does play out that people do bring to the fore some of those, those key issues. So it was, it was bottom up really being the most exciting and then with, with some of those core metrics as well um, in terms of the ones that everyone knows in terms of our the history we talk about in terms of Southampton. Brilliant. I have a question here from Margaret. Um, there's been no mention of climate or environment crisis so why is that not uh, the major or most important element of our bid? Our green and blue spaces need urgent attention. Well, I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to start, and then Fraser, if you can take over. Um, I mean, obviously, we can't tell you what's in our program because it's um, still part of the bidding process. But climate is absolutely uh, a central theme all the way through, as it absolutely should be. Some of the program directly addresses uh, uh, the climate crisis. Um, other parts of the program are um, really. Um, 
being delivered in the way that's uh, you know best for the environment. So it's been something that's been uh, all the way through. But Fraser, you've been involved specifically in some of our strategy around that. Yeah, it's it's a really good question because it is critical, and we're all aware of this. And it's also a challenge for anything that's looking at large scale events. So this is something that we've been in, engaging with, and. It, there will be a sort of um, there is a strategy that's been developed and also an underpinning values about how we we see this within the bid. So it is it is front and centre, but it, we also recognise that um, it is a challenge that needs to be addressed in terms of quantifying the impact of, of this, not only telling the story of climate change and the need to act, but also thinking responsibly about how the programme conforms to those values and ideals and how we make it transparent that it's doing it. Unsurprisingly, that transparency is an underpinning principle in everything that we're doing. We've talked, we've had to talk quite vaguely. People have asked about impact, legacy. All of this has, as, as well as we can, got markers that go with it for how are we going to demonstrate it? So what was the starting position and how are we going to measure any changes and attribute them to the actions that uh, are being undertaken through City of Culture? And I don't think there's a naivety around the challenge of that environmental footprint when you are talking about events and large scale activities but we also know that there are there are routes through this um, in terms of working with people uh, and and building it into how we conduct them so without being able to talk about the specifics absolutely this is a critical thing and the government also recognized that to be fair to them within the bidding criteria each bid has to address this as part of their um, document Thank you very much. Um, so we've got a question from Diana Galpin. The excitement and enthusiasm is palpable. Can you share some share of the things that we will actually do to deliver the impact and legacy? That's a hard one, Di, because um, so I'm being, talking too much um, because of the specificity and, and how it relates to where we are. So you can you can break it down sort of into into sectors or areas that we're having impact effectively and they all do have indicators that go with them we're not being completely drawn to that because some things which are important are also hard to measure and that's recognized within the bid so some of our core aspirations will take time to play out and also don't have an, a very easy number or tribute that can be assigned to it but essentially there are structures um, to a delivery and top and the sort of the classic time scales and, and mechanisms to, to ensure that they happen um, so that's a very vague answer to a very precise question but um, <laughs> I think that's as good as I can I'm allowed to give at the moment that's brilliant. Uh, I'm just conscious of the time. Um, we're coming to the end of the event and there's so many more questions. So I'm very sorry that we're not able to, to make it through all of them. Thank you for all your questions. Thank you for the passionate responses from the panel. It's been amazing. Um, before we before we close up the event, um, please uh, do uh, provide some responses to the feedback survey that we will we'll be passing on to you guys. It's really important for us to know how these events go, do you like them, what works, what doesn't. Um, and also, as just what has been said throughout the session, use our social media channels, really promote, engage, uh, contribute, because that's how we can really showcase the commitment and the passion that we have for our city as well. Just before we um, just before we leave, I uh, want to share a short video that showcases the rich and diverse and inclusive culture that Southampton is home to. So please do sit back, see how many places you can recognise. Southampton is like a treasure chest with so many stories. And the good thing about Southampton is it's a welcoming city. It's part of you. You'll always find a space for you. Yeah, this is definitely a place I want to stay in at. And plus it's like part of my heritage as well. It's like where I want to be. It's where people will feel wanted and belong. As a writer and an artist, I started doing work that I'd never done before in Southampton. The way in which the city rebuilt itself, you've got like the ancient walls right next to modern buildings. And it's sort of a symbol, the way in which it's this kind of patchwork of different types of stories and different types of communities. And I'm really grateful for that because it means that everybody has a place. And I found my place here.
there is a love for the music within the city. Bands want to play where they're going to have the best shows. Southampton has a massive music here. With everyone working together as a city and united as one, I feel like Southampton really can be on the map and inspire other people to do the same. Southampton's always on the cusp of understanding if a band's going to be big, it will be like a sold out show. It's just one of those things, isn't it? No, no handout, so I had to take it. Late nights, no sleep on a daily basis. Told my mum I can't stop now, I've got to make it. I'm from the same city as Cray Davey. We all have flashbacks in our lives. I'm sitting there in command of the world's biggest ocean liner. I can just remember myself sitting on the stones on, on the beach off Western Shore there, just watching the Queen Mary or the Queen Elizabeth sailing in. I would never have imagined that I'd actually be in command of one of those ships and taking the ship myself into the Port of Southampton. <laughs> What is it that we can give to people? What is it that a certainty can give to us? And what is it that we can give back to the community? It's about living, and we are living our dream. And that's happening right now. Yeah, so we want the world, world to know what's happening here in Southampton.